study on how we can make our lives better. We are in the session of family life. The one who wedded me over 20 years ago told me that uh, the certificate he was giving me was enrollment certificate, admission in fact, admission letter into a school where there is no graduation. So I am wedding people too nowadays and whenever I give them the certificate, I tell them that uh, this is an admission letter to a school where there is no what, no graduation, okay? We continue learning until death do us part. And we thank God for the institution of marriage. You all know that it was the first institution after the Sabbath that was given to man. And it is the only thing that together with Sabbath that we came out of heaven with. Let me ask before I go to the study of God's word, how many in this meeting, if you are given a chance and you go back to courting, you will court the same person you are married to? <laughs> ah, <laughs> I hope you are sincere. <laughs> because people go through a lot in marriage. I was trying to talk to a friend of mine who had issues with the wife. They had been married for, I think, over 15 years. And they were contemplating divorce. So I intervened and tried to talk to this friend of mine and I told him, you know, Bana, just keep on trying to make this thing work. It is God who gave you this wife. Then he said, this one, I was not given by God. This one, the devil brought to, to, to torture my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know your experience in marriage. I don't know. But I'm in one. So, I know what we are in. We can talk together to see how we can improve our marriages and make them the way God wanted them to be. My friend, when I was quoting my, my wife, the one I, I am living with now, those days we used to write letters. There were no phones. So I used to write full scraps, many. One, two, three, or four pages expressing love. And uh, I remember going, now I don't know whether they buy cards nowadays. This youth of nowadays, I don't know whether they do. But we used to buy cards. Big ones, like I went somewhere when you were courting and bought a very big one with nice uh, flowers, uh, with a heart, red, written sweetheart, to express love. I, I, don't, I don't see myself buying them nowadays. I don't know what has happened. <laughs> so the question I'm going to ask you before we begin here, is, are things the way they were when you were quoting each other? Huh? I can hear the answer, no, men are quiet, but <laughs> ladies are saying no. I remember walking several times, paying fare several times, doing so many things. So what has happened? 
why is the flame not there? You know, I asked this question in one of the family life sessions, and the response was, now, you know, when you are cooking, there's a stage where it simmers. You just keep the fire at the same level so that uh, the thing cooks well. So some say, no, 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 the flame is still there, but it is in a different way. Huh? The big question I'm asking is how do you uh, uh, grade your marriage? Is it okay? Are you struggling in it? Are you happy together? And so on and so forth. Those are questions that you can answer yourself. However, God has given us by the word of God, we can also improve our relationships wherever we are and make the lives of those in our families and even our lives better. That's the intention of God. I've been thinking, why did God institute marriage? Or why did God institute family? The reason is because God is love and because God is love, he wants his love to be manifested in the family. And the family is a place where, as it were, when people look and see, they can also say, ah, this is beautiful. This is love. This is love in action. And that's what all family is about. I would like us to read a few texts and then we discuss. I, I have chosen purposefully during this year's camp meeting at Victory to use the book Songs of Solomon or Songs of Songs to speak to us about family. I will read Songs of Songs chapter 2. Chapter 2. Uh, by the way, we can even uh, start with how it begins before we go to the other parts of this book. Chapter 1, verse 1. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. That is the wife or the bride speaking. I don't know whether that is your experience. But now, my point is in chapter 2, we'll read verse 14. Sorry, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. It says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He browses among the lilies, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hill. My emphasis is on the first line. My beloved is mine and I am his. Can you say that about your spouse? That's the challenge I'm trying to pose to us this afternoon. The same line appears several times in the book of Songs of Solomon. You can read the very, very line like that in chapter 7, verse 10. Can you go to chapter 7, verse 10? Chapter 7, verse 10. I belong to my beloved and this desire is for me. The same thought, my beloved is mine and I am his. The idea you get when you're reading the book of Songs of Solomon 
is that these people were in love. They were in love. And this is what God intends for our marriages. I know in some families, instead of people being uh, soulmates, they are roommates, roommates. Eh? You meet in the evening and stay in one room. There was one which even shocked me, uh, husband and wife. But they have separate bedrooms. Uh, I don't know how they operate, but that's how they have decided to live. We don't know what goes on there, but the indications are they live together under the same roof, but as different individuals. Is your marriage lacking the spark that made you and your spouse to come together when you courted and when you married each other? Love in marriage is something that is nurtured. And uh, today and maybe tomorrow, we will share how we can do that. And God intends that in our marriages, we nurture each other by loving each other. La just like manna in the Old Testament, where you had to wake up and pick it each day, so also is the life of marriage that God has given us. You cannot love in arrears. Uh, like I was in a certain Bible study and the topic was marriage. And then the speaker asked a question, men, do you love your wives? Then men said, yes, we do. Then there was a follow-up question. How do you love your wives? We buy food for them. We buy clothes for them. We build houses for them. And uh, we married them. We couldn't have married them if we didn't do what? If we didn't love them. Then the speaker asked the ladies, Ladies, do you feel loved when food is bought for you, when somebody builds for you a house, and so many other questions? Then the lady said, yes, but. So there was something more that the ladies wanted that the husbands were not providing. That illustration showed me that Love is something that is done daily. And if I may even say, Father, even hourly, it is something you live with throughout your life. Just imagine a home where the concern of each and everyone is about the other. That is a beautiful home where the interests of the husband is about the wife. That is a beautiful home. Where the interests of the wife is about the husband. That's a beautiful home. And that's what God intended the homes to be. But I asked you a question when we read these texts in the book of Songs of Solomon. Now, if you read the book of Songs of Solomon, the flame of love was uh, a, a huge one and a very obvious one. And these things that we have read expresses that these two couples had not only what we express as uh, love, in a simple way, it was a romance that cuts 
cross through this book of songs of Solomon. Now, was everything right in this book? Were they living a life that had no problems? I will tell you no. There were issues, if you read carefully, the book of Songs of Solomon. Just as you start reading the book of Songs of Solomon, the lady says that she is dark. And I think of something here. Seems where she was married or to the home of Solomon, she was not accepted easily. She was a Shunammite. She was not a Jew. And Shunammites had a dark complexion. That's why she says, I am dark. Yet Solomon still loved this dark lady, even though. What am I trying to say? There were issues of acceptance. And in detail, I'm saying there were frictions also in this marriage. Yes, if you read this book, you will find in chapter 5, I looked for my lover, and he was away. I woke up, and there are issues in chapter 5. Why is it that there are issues in this marriage, but they still love one another? They still shower each other with, my lover is mine and I am his. That is the question we should ask ourselves. And basically, I am asking, I don't know what you're going through in marriage. Aha. Uh -huh. How can you also, even though there are frictions, even though there are issues in the marriage life that you have, how can you still live better, fulfilling life with all this? By the way, the reason I read that passage is to show us, not as it is in the West. The West, you know what happens? They marry because they feel the romantic love is, is a feeling, which is right. Uh, romance is a feeling, and those who are married should have it. They marry because they feel that you are beautiful. They marry because there is chemistry. But that chemistry can come in the morning and leave in the evening. So that's why you find... Uh, much of what is happening in the West and is creeping into our countries in Africa, people get into marriage because of feeling only. There are two aspects of love. How many charge? Two. One is what I've been talking about, romance. And the other is self-sacrificing principle of love. In marriage, we need both. If you are in marriage because of feelings only, you'll have problems. God wants to teach us that in marriage also, we should love in spite of. Now, let me give you an example. Oh, how many are married here? Raise up your hands. How many are married here? Okay, that's one. The second question. How many have been annoyed by their spouses in this congregation? There are some who have not been annoyed. <laughs> Sometimes a spouse can really annoy you. Huh? You, you, you don't, you understand, what is this I'm going through now? Even ask yourself, how did I, how did I arrive here? Eh? What is this now? At that moment, is there a feeling? Eh? Zero. Feeling is what? Zero. You don't have feel, but you don't go away because you felt nothing. 
In marriage, there will be moments like that. When your spouse annoys you and does something bad. Like there's a case that was brought to me and I think the, la the lady was right. A man or the husband and men who are here, sometimes let's assist these uh, wives of ours. The man went and took a two million loan without informing the what? The wife. Then, two or three months down the line, the man lost the job. And you know, we always take loans because you're working somewhere. You can service the what? The loan. So when he lost his job, uh, the problem came up because he didn't have money now. He went to the lady to ask for money to service the what? The loan. And the lady in the first place didn't do what? Did no. Uh, ladies, should you divorce that man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should you continue living with such a, such a fellow uh, who does such things to you? At that moment, you, you, you feel so bad about that man. You feel so bad about that man. But even with that feeling, there is a vow you took uh, when you were being wedded. You remember the vow? In what? <laughs> in sickness, in this, in that, in this, until what? Until death do us part. So death has not happened. Where are you going? Huh? <laughs> until death uh, do us part. Where are you going? And then uh, there was another one I was told. Now this is about men. A lady was unfaithful unfaithful. And there's nothing so serious to men as a lady being what? Unfaithful. So this lady left home and went on with the life of unfaithfulness. Got a baby of unfaithfulness. So when she was tired of the life of unfaithfulness, wrote a letter. Honey, I want to come back. And the man said, honey, come back. Was the man a fool or... Uh... <laughs> honey, honey, come back. I was told a real story. I was in a cup meeting like this and I was showed the man who did that. Honey, come back. So the lady came back with the baby and the man, those days we used to wait for people at the stage, the 80s. The man went to the stage and they carried the baby home. And uh, when he was having that camp meeting, it is about 15 years ago and the child was grown. I don't know what you are going through in marriage. I know you are asking, what is that man doing? I am not qualifying the act as good or bad. But I'm saying, in marriage, people go through hell. People go through hell. And for us, we have been separated. There are some young people who are now out there. For them... They can look at a girl, but because he, 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 she's not yet uh, a wife, he can decide, I can, I'll look at another one. But for us here, somebody described the vehicle that we are in as a vehicle without reverse gear. Forward ever. Eh? Muzuri Mbaya, forward, forward ever. How? Do you go on with this idea of forward ever in your marriage? But let me just say that uh, I don't want to go out of this without saying that there are some issues that can make you think 
that uh, we need time to think that whether this thing can work if there is physical abuse. That is totally a different story. If there's physical abuse, that is something that we can say you need to withstand. I titled the small talk that we have this afternoon, Marriage is a Commitment. Marriage is a what? Is a commitment. That is why, yes, there is romance in marriage, but it is more than romance. There is that element of self sacrifice. Okay? There's something that you seriously don't like about your spouse, but you go overboard. Either being patient about it, or if you're not patient about it, praying about it, that's an element of being patient about it, that's an element of self-sacrifice. There is also loving your spouse in spite of some things that you don't like in him or her. One of the ways by which we can do that, and I think this is what we should always do in our marriages, is to look at your spouse. And by the way, if I had time, I would give you papers and I would request you to write things you don't like about your spouse and also write things that you like about your spouse and I would encourage you to look at those things you like about your spouse. That's how marriages are built. Because in that man or that woman, there's something that is good about her. There's something that is good about him. Let us focus on that. And that is how we can make our marriages better. And when you do that, when you focus on the positives in your marriage, you are building your marriage. You're not destroying your marriage. If you focus on those things that are not right in your marriage, you are destroying your marriage. And they are there, for sure. Each and every one of us have issues that you think are not right. Pray about them, find out how you can change them, but your focus should be on the strengths that you have or that your spouse has. And that can make your marriage to be one that is strong. God gives us some principles that can assist us in our marriages. And they are the usual ones that I want to read with you. Uh, these are found in Ephesians 5. Let us read Ephesians 5. There's something that I would like to share with you in that passage. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll read from verse 21. Okay. I have started from verse 21 because of a reason. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it goes forth and says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So, wives that you are here, what is the Bible prescribing that you do? Submit. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, it's a difficult thing in the age of freedom, women rights, human rights, to talk of this, but this is the biblical instruction that we are given. And let me tell you, ladies, you cannot do this if you don't have, first of all, 
the humility that comes from Jesus and the love that Jesus puts in our hearts. Then husbands, verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing which is through the word. Uh, simple. These are texts that we have read over and over and over again. I'm using them again this afternoon to emphasize how we can commit ourselves to uh, marriage, something that uh, God has made you have. Need to look at it that way also because the spirit of prophecy says, Never ever think that your marriage is a mistake. What does the spirit of prophecy say? Let me hear this section say it. What does the spirit of prophecy say? I'll help you again. Never ever think your marriage is a what? A mistake. Even one day, never think like that, that your marriage is a mistake. God has a purpose, God has a reason why you are in that marriage. Now, from that perspective of marriage being made by God, how can we make our marriages lively and better? I said, first of all, think of them as a covenant that you made with your spouse, not only with your spouse, but with God. And by the way, the one who instituted marriage is God, isn't it? Yeah, it is God who did what? Who instituted marriage. And there's one time I read a book. The book was discussing the wedding at Cana. And you know what the book said? The book said that that marriage had a problem. And th that wedding feast, yes, it had a problem. And what was the problem? It had run out of what? Of wine, isn't it? Yeah. And the book was saying that just as that wedding ran out of wine, so also sometimes our marriages have hitches. Hitches is a small word to use. But our marriages have problems. But how can we sort them out? How was the one at Cana sorted out? It was sorted out because Jesus was present in that wedding. Uh, did you hear me? Yeah, Jesus was what? Was present in that wedding. So we are united in marriage. But this marriage will become a better union if we have the presence of Jesus in it. Probably the question I should ask, the spouses who are here, is Jesus present in your marriage? If he is present these principles that we are trying to share this afternoon will not be a problem. Because even the submission is qualified as in the Lord. Submit as you would submit to who? To the Lord. And so, if Jesus is present, then other things will fall in place. So, welcome Jesus in your marriage. Sometimes we think we know, but the best thing to do with your married life is to commit it to the Lord. Marriage can bring a lot of pain in our lives. And indeed, if there's something that is so painful in life, is being hurt, by, the somebody, by someone you trust. Isn't it? Yeah, those who are here, those who have been in marriage, there's nothing as hurting 
as being hurt by somebody you do what? You trust. How can we manage the heartaches and the problems that we encounter in marriage? My suggestion is simple. Just as it happened in Cana, please welcome Jesus in your marriage. And that's why what we are reading in Ephesians will happen. When we welcome Jesus in our marriages, then we will be able to submit. Then we will be able to love. Husbands, uh, fellow men who are here, I am also a typical African man. Very difficult for men to say I love you. I don't know, you ladies, uh, maybe the younger, the younger ones can say I love you easily. But this, these men who are uh, close to my age, it is usually very difficult to open our mouths and say, <laughs> say I love you. Uh, but these ladies want to hear. It is an instruction from the Bible, my friend. Spouses. Sometimes when you say I love you, the wife will be surprised. Why is it so good today? What is in store today? Okay, what is he trying to do today? Because it is not you. It is strange, it's a strange behavior. When you go home this evening, I love you, they'll say, hey, what is happening today? <laughs> but this lady is wanting to hear that thing. Not only here, they want to see it in you. We'll spend one afternoon to see how we can be experts in that. Uh, let me tell you, my friends, God has put us in marriage to learn how to love and to learn how to express what? To express love. It is a school training us on how we can express love. Men are instructed to love their wives and love just as Christ did what? As Christ loved. It is interesting when you read these Ephesians, because it is saying men are the head. But how should they lead? They should lead just like Christ led the church. And just like Christ demonstrated his love for the what? For the church. And how was it? It was by giving him what? Himself. That's how Christ demonstrated his love for his church. And therefore, I ask us to commit ourselves to this union. I know in a meeting like this, there could be even those who are contemplating separation or divorce. My prayer is look at marriage as an institution that was set up by God and God has given you your spouse so that through you, he or she may know who God is. I was told a story by a professor of mine. She taught me English. She was a missionary. And she told me that the reason she became a, miss a missionary was because of her father, who was a pastor. One day, this pastor had a quarrel with the wife. So even as pastors, we quarrel sometimes with our, <laughs> with our wives. We are human. That happens. Your pastor here will also share with you, if, she's fr if he's frank, that sometimes we quarrel. But the quarrel was open. It was a heated quarrel in the home until the children knew that there was something wrong between daddy and mommy. The pastor was going to preach and they were to drive in one car to church. Eh? So they entered the car. The atmosphere was so tense in the car. No one speaking to the other. Then this pastor thought, how will I preach with this situation now? 
Eh? Will I just go and uh, go to the pulpit and start saying love, love, or love one another there while these people are uh, boiling down there in the congregation? The pastor went aside and took the car aside and uh, told the wife, honey, white men do that, honey, sorry, I was what? I was wrong. And the atmosphere that was boiling in the car went away. There was like freedom and air which was fresh blowing through that car. They went to church and the man preached freely. What made the difference? It was, I am sorry that the man said so men who are here, very difficult for us to say, I am sorry. See what it, that thing did. That thing made the daughter to know that daddy is a man of God. Daddy is a loving person. And made that daughter to become also like the father. It is a campaign period, so... So many choppers are flying here and there. I don't know whether there are aspirants around here, but uh, we wish you well if you are. <laughs> it is a very difficult period for aspirants, but we wish them well. I know this big church may have some. We will pray for you. And what will we pray about? God's will. To do what? <laughs> to happen. Because how do we force God if he does not want you to be a leader? Eh? Just pray God's will to happen so that you become a leader. But now we are talking about family. Let's express love if we are husbands. And let's also play our role as women to submit. Both loving and submitting cannot occur if Jesus is not in our lives and cannot occur if we don't look at marriage as something that is a covenant between myself and my spouse and also between us and God. I have a cousin who is in Europe and she shocked us. She said there, what we do, you try out marriage and if it isn't working, you walk out. So you have a contract, let's see if it's working within one or two years. So you stay as a husband and wife for one or two years, and then you walk out if it isn't working. Not so with the biblical principle of marriage. In the Bible, when we are married, we are committed till death do as what? Do as part. Now, this is a learning session. Uh, sorry, I stood very far from you. But if you have a comment or a question, you can ask. I see I have one or two minutes. Uh, we can uh, ask a question. Or if you have a comment, you can raise uh, before we close with a word of prayer. Anybody with a comment or a question? Oh, yes, there's a question there. You can give him the mic. Thank you, my pastor. Uh, I came late, so maybe you could have uh, covered this. But uh, the Genesis chapter 2, now that you are very scriptural in your approach to, to family life, uh, Genesis chapter 2 verses 24 says that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Which living is this? Because in our culture... Oh, they are laughing. You know, you know what the question was going to be. <laughs> in, 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 in that Genesis, where the principle of marriage is, expel, is expressed, he's asking, man shall leave his father. But in Africa, men don't leave. It is women who do what? Who leave. Now, leaving in that passage implies setting up a new unit. Setting up a new what? A new unit. It's not uh, necessarily uh, saying that uh, uh, 
you go to where the wife is uh, born. That's not the, what the scripture is trying to express. You'll find that a man, the scripture says, a man shall leave his parents and be united with his what? With his wife. Let me just mention that scripture, especially the Old Testament, was patriarchal. And the home was formed by a what? By a man. So a man leaving his parents implies that this man is forming a new unit. And there's a very important thing in that. Those of you who now have daughters who are married or sons who are married, don't encroach there. They have left. That's a new what? A new unit. The unit of a family is distinct before God. Though Africa, we have what is called extended family, but when a new unit is formed, our role is to assist them, love one another in that new unit. So living here, if I may say it again, is forming a new unit, a new family. If I may paraphrase the passage, and a man shall leave his parents and form a new unit that is called a what? A family. So it is not literally a man leaving his parents and uh, going to where the woman is. There are some cultures that practice that. But let me say, even Af in Africa we do that. Just a few years ago, I like planting trees. I was still in my mother's, my mother is there, my father's home. My mother likes keeping animals. So there was always a clash. When I plant oranges or when I plant some nice tree I found somewhere, when I go back home, I found they are done what? They are eaten by her goats. One day I suggested, now, mommy, what do I do? Let me make for you a paddock and you keep your goats somewhere. She refused. I must stay close to my what? My goats should not be very far away from me. Then one day when I was getting worked up because of this, she plainly told me, this is my what? This is my home. Go build your home. <laughs> Go build your home. And I thought about that woman and I said, this woman is right. This is not my home. I built my home. And now I'm planting my things and they are not being destroyed. So a man shall leave and form his own what? His own unit. The bell has gone. Thank you for that question. But before I leave, man shall leave. This is not for you, but you need to tell your children and young ones. Living here is a public declaration that you are forming a new unit. There is a social dimension to this. That's why in the Bible, we don't the uh, Bible does not support cohabiting, just walking in and staying with someone. Living is a public declaration that you are forming a new unit that is called a family. That's why we have weddings. In wedding, it is declaration that I am doing what? I am living. Thank you very much. Let's meet again tomorrow to discuss more about these things. We shall have more time to interact. Just as I said in the beginning, uh, when you are married and the pastor gives you that certificate. That certificate is supposed to be what? Admission letter. Admission letter into what? Marriage. Do we graduate? No. We are students. And in that school, Jesus is the only principal. All of us are what? Students. Thank you very much. I think we shall bow or rise. We have sat for a long time. Rise up for a closing prayer. Our
loving Heavenly Father, we've learned that you instituted marriage so that we learn how to love one another in this institution. Standing here this afternoon are men and women who have been married for some time. You know them by their names and you know these family units. It is our prayer, dear Jesus, that your presence may be in these units and that whenever troubles arise, your presence may bring a solution to the problems that occur in these marriages. May you bless them with your grace so that as we've read in your word, they may be submissive and they may be loving. This week, in this camp meeting, we invite your blessings to be upon each and every session. May you minister to each and every one of us in a special way. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name.